the sixth lecture. By now you've seen a lot of the basics of Bitcoin, how the system works, how mining works, and how to use Bitcoin as a currency. Now let's get to what has been one of the most controversial aspects of Bitcoin, which is the anonymity properties of Bitcoin. And in fact, there's a lot about Bitcoin and anonymity that you'll hear different opinions on. Is Bitcoin anonymous, first of all? Are anonymous cryptocurrencies even a good thing? Is it good for people who have a stake in Bitcoin? Is it good for society? And what are the various, various proposals that have been made to improve Bitcoin's anonymity? Uh, how well do those work? Which of those should we adopt? And so on. So in this, this lecture, what we're going to do is help cut through all of that confusion. And uh, we're going to discuss uh, where things are, what are the options, and where things seem to be going. So let's start like this. Let's start with uh, a basic understanding of what we even mean when we say anonymity in Bitcoin and some of the overall concepts like how does anonymity tie into privacy? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Can we only have the good aspects of anonymity without the bad? A variety of questions like that. And then we'll see a variety of uh, proposals, uh, some already existing and some that uh, may be implemented someday for improving Bitcoin's anonymity or creating different anonymous cryptocurrencies altogether. And what's interesting about them is that they offer a variety of uh, increasing levels of cryptographic sophistication as we go down this list, and we'll learn to see what the trade-offs are and uh, analyze the anonymity properties, how deployable these are, and so on. All right, let's get started. If you look online, you'll see there are a number of people in groups saying that Bitcoin is anonymous. There is no shortage of uh, opinions on this. Let me just pull out one quote in particular. Uh, this is the WikiLeaks donation page. It says, in plain and simple terms, Bitcoin is a secure and anonymous currency. Is that actually true? Well, you'll also find a variety of opinions to the contrary. Again, I'm just pulling out one example. This is uh, the Wired UK saying, uh, Bitcoin won't hide you from the NSA's prying eyes. So how can we resolve this confusion? Uh, let's, uh, let's look at what the word anonymous means. At quite a literal level, anonymous means without a name. And so what does that mean exactly? Well, there's two ways to interpret it. Uh, we know that in Bitcoin, addresses are public keys. You don't need to put in your real name in order to interact with the system, uh, or public key hashes uh, instead of real identities. Uh, but we can interpret this property of being without a name in two different ways. We can interpret it as interacting without your real name, or we can interpret it as interacting without any name at all. Now, if you interpret it as interacting without your real name, then certainly Bitcoin is anonymous in that sense. But we do have these public key hashes that act as some sort of pseudo identities. And so when computer scientists look at the situation, they don't use the term anonymous to describe this. They call this pseudonymity. And there's a very clear difference between the two, and uh, it's an important one, and we'll see why in a second. You might wonder, yeah, even though you're using a pseudonym, which is your public key hash, you can create any number of them. You can uh, have uh, uh, as many pseudonyms as you want. Does that make it anonymous? Well, uh, the answer is not quite, and uh, we'll get into that as well. Okay, so if computer scientists call this pseudonymity, what is anonymity then? Is there a clear definition of what it would take for something to be called anonymous? At a conceptual level, the answer is very simple. Anonymity in computer science is just pseudonymity together with unlinkability. So what is this property called unlinkability? At an intuitive level, we'll get into uh, better definitions in a little bit, but at an intuitive level, what unlinkability means is that as a user interacts with a system repeatedly, these different interactions should not be able to be tied to each other from the point of view of some adversary. So you have to be talking about a specific adversary uh, for this to even make sense. Now, this distinction here between full anonymity and mere pseudonymity is something that uh, you might be familiar with from a variety of other contexts. And one good way that I like to explain this is to look at online forums. And again here, the distinction between a mere pseudonymous interaction and anonymous interaction comes up in different forums, and Reddit is a good example of a forum where you pick a long-term pseudonym and uh, interact over a period of time with that pseudonym. You could create different pseudonyms, but it's going to be practically infeasible to create a new pseudonym every single time you want to post a comment, and it's not even very meaningful. So Reddit offers pseudonymous interaction. The opposite of that, fully anonymous interaction, where you can make posts with no attribution at all, 
is the model that you typically have in 4chan. And uh, there's a similar difference in Bitcoin as well, and Bitcoin is in the pseudonymous model more than the anonymous model. Okay, but let's talk about why this difference is important in Bitcoin. Why is mere pseudonymity not sufficient if you want privacy? After all, if you have pseudonymity, it seems like even if somebody can create a pseudonymous profile of all of your interactions on the system, they can't tie it back to your real identity. Well, here's the answer to that. It turns out that if you have this pseudonymous profile, it's pretty fragile. It's very easy for it to get linked back to your real identity at some point. And if that happens at any point, then of course, all of your transactions, past, present, and future, have been linked to your identity. So here are a couple of different ways in which that can happen. One is that a variety of Bitcoin businesses, online wallet services, exchanges, and others, even vendors in a lot of cases, are going to want your real life identity in order to let you transact with them. Consider this analogy. You go to a coffee shop, you pay for your coffee with Bitcoins, and of course, if you're there in the store, then uh, the person who's giving you your coffee sort of knows what, who you are, even if they don't actually ask for your real name. And so your physical identity does get tied to one of your Bitcoin transactions. And if that Bitcoin transaction then gets tied to all of your Bitcoin transactions, then that is a complete violation of anonymity. So this notion of a pseudonymous profile is very fragile. It could easily get compromised in a variety of ways. And also, even if such a direct linkage doesn't happen, these linked profiles can be de-anonymized due to side channels. What do I mean by side channels? Well, here's something that I find intriguing that uh, might seem like a tall claim, but in fact, such things have been known to happen. Maybe somebody looks at a profile of your pseudonymous Bitcoin transactions and finds that uh, you interact at certain times of day and they're able to correlate the times of day when you're active online with the times of day when uh, your Twitter account is posting tweets, and so they're able to find a connection between your Twitter identity and uh, your transactions on Bitcoin. Similar attacks have been known to happen, so this is why this notion of a pseudonymous profile is considered quite fragile, and for real anonymity, we want the stronger notion of unlinkability. So let's try to define it in a little bit more concrete sense, what unlinkability means in the context of Bitcoin. And uh, we can do that in a variety of different ways. One is that it should be hard to link together different addresses of the same user. Another is that it should be hard to link together different transactions made by the same user. Both of these seem intuitive. Look at this one, though. It should be hard to link the sender of a payment to its recipient. This one might sound a little confusing at first. Because if you interpret a payment as a Bitcoin transaction, then of course that transaction has inputs and outputs. And these inputs and outputs are inevitably going to be in the blockchain publicly and linked together. And so you might think that uh, this is impossible to achieve. But if we interpret this notion of payment in a different way, not as a single direct Bitcoin transaction, but perhaps an indir indirect sort of payment that goes through a circuitous route of transactions, then one might imagine that the ultimate sender and the ultimate recipient of that payment might not immediately be uh, linkable uh, looking at the Bitcoin blockchain. So these are all somewhat more concrete, but still at an intuitive level, uh, varieties of unlinkability that one might want to shoot for. But if you look at this last definition, it might still be not entirely convincing. Let's say that uh, you pay for a particular product and it costs a certain amount of Bitcoin, and then maybe you send that payment through a circuitous route of transactions, but still you might think somebody looking at the blockchain must be able to infer something, specifically that Bitcoins left some address, a certain number of Bitcoins, and Bitcoins showed up at some other, some other address. And these two might be slightly different because of transaction fees and so on, but roughly equal. And also roughly at the same, in the same time period, because there can't be too much of a lag between the uh, sending and the, and the receiving of a payment. And so clearly, even if we try to achieve this kind of unlinkability, it can be unlinkability between all possible transactions, but some smaller subset of transactions that look like each other. So let's make this a little bit more concrete now. And this is how we quantify anonymity. We usually don't try to achieve complete unlinkability, which is unlinkability among all possible transactions or addresses in the system. But instead, we go for something more measured. We try to maximize the size of our anonymity set. The anonymity set is the size of the crowd of other addresses or transactions that we're trying to hide in. 
So if I can be reasonably sure that with respect to some adversary, there are these thousand other transactions that look just like mine, and the adversary can't tell which one was mine, then that we might consider it to be a pretty good level of anonymity. And to calculate this anonymity set, it's not trivial at all. It takes a few steps. You have to first define concretely what your adversary model is. And you have to reason carefully about what that adversary knows, what they don't know, and what they cannot know. And there's no general formula for doing this. It requires carefully analyzing each protocol and system and doing it on a case-by-case -case basis. I want to point out that uh, in the Bitcoin community, often people carry out intuitive analyses of anonymity services, for example, mixing services that we're going to see later in this lecture. And often they come up with ways like taint analysis. This is an intuitive way that tracks uh, the flow between a particular sending address and a particular receiving address. And intuitively, it might make a lot of sense, but uh, if we consider it from the point of view of uh, how we actually should calculate anonymity, taint analysis is not a very good measure of how much anonymity you get from a system. And the reason for that it is, is that it assumes a particular type of attack the adversary might, might carry out, a rather naive attack looking directly for quantities of flow between a sending and a receiving address. And if your adversary were a little bit cleverer than that, then uh, you might carry out taint analysis and think that you have a lot of an anonymity in a certain situation, but in fact you might not. So uh, qu the bottom line from this slide is that quantifying anonymity must be done in terms of the anonymity set, and in some cases probability distributions on top of that anonymity set, and it requires a careful analysis of the protocol in the system. You can't apply a, sim a simple formula. Okay. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the ethics of anonymity. Why do people want anonymity? We've already seen a little bit the connection between anonymity and privacy, but let's make that very concrete. Now, in blockchain-based currencies, because all transactions are recorded on the ledger, they're totally and publicly and permanently traceable. And so if your identity ever gets linked to these transactions, you're in a situation where your privacy level is much worse than you get with traditional banking. Why? Because anybody might be able to carry out this type of de-anonymization attack, not specifically a company or a government that you might be worried about, any member of the public. And your transactions, since they're permanent, your loss of anonymity years down the line could affect all your transactions today and vice versa. So we really want anonymity to even get the privacy level of cryptocurrencies to the level that we enjoy with, uh, with the traditional system. But also people hope that it can give us a new level of privacy. Of course, we have to acknowledge the concerns as well. And one of the major concerns is money laundering and all of the bad things that that can enable. So let's talk about that. This is definitely a legitimate worry. I wouldn't uh, be in favor of studying anonymity in cryptocurrencies and ignoring the ethical aspects and saying, oh, that's not something I'm going to worry about. I'm only interested in the technology. I think it's important to consider the ethical aspects. There's one item of comfort that I will offer, though. If you look at how things stand currently in Bitcoin, uh, the difficulty of things like money laundering is not necessarily because the blockchain is, is not so anonymous and so it's easy to trace flows, but instead the difficulty stems much more from the fact that moving large flows into and out of the currency rather than within Bitcoin is what is really hard. In other words, cashing out is hard. And so anti-money laundering efforts uh, have great promise if they're focused in this part of the system. And the good news is that all of these attempts to improve anonymity in Bitcoin uh, don't affect this part of the equation in any way. And so uh, I would recommend that uh, Bitcoin researchers and developers coordinate efforts with uh, anti-money laundering efforts by law enforcement and others so that the technical aspect of Bitcoin anonymity can be relatively separate uh, from law enforcement and uh, legal aspects and so on. Nevertheless, one could try to ask, can't we design the technology in such a way that only the good uses of Bitcoin anonymity are allowed and the bad uses are somehow permitted? Well, this turns out to be a quite common conundrum in computer security and privacy. In a lot of scenarios, we want something like this, but it never turns out to be possible. Why? Because these different uses that we're talking about that we perceive as being very different morally are going to be almost identical technologically. And if we want to encode some sort of moral rules into the technical rules of the system that are going to be automatically enforced by miners, it's not even clear how to do that. And so hence my recommendation of separating out 
the uh, technical anonymity properties of the system with uh, the uh, legal principles that we put on top of it uh, in terms of how people use that currency. It's not a completely satisfactory solution, but it's perhaps the best way we have of trading off the good with the bad. I do want to point out but that uh, this is far from the first time that we're considering this dilemma. Uh, it's come up in the context of Tor, an anonymous communication network. And uh, uh, anonymous communication enables uh, bad actions at least as much as uh, uh, anonymous moving of funds does. And so Tor has really ha had to grapple with this problem. Uh, in, a, in a very simple and single picture, Tor is a communication network that routes messages between a sender and a receiver uh, through a network of nodes, but further through some clever encryption ensures that as long as at least some of the nodes in that network are honest, then uh, the adversary is not going to be able to uh, link the sender to the receiver. So that's what Tor does, and uh, you can see how it can enable a lot of bad activities. Let's look at some activities, good and bad, that do happen on the Tor network. It's used, first of all, by normal people who want to protect themselves from being tracked online by marketers or various other privacy properties online when they're browsing websites. It's used by journalists and activists and uh, dissidents and so on, and so that's clearly an important use case. It's also used by law enforcement, because if they wanted to do an electronic sting operation, then you want to be able to visit websites without revealing that your IP address is coming from a law enforcement block. And so clearly a lot of activities that uh, we might approve of, but it's also used by botnets, for example, for spreading malware between nodes in the network. And uh, unfortunately, there is also child pornography in the network. So distinguishing between these uses at a technical level is essentially impossible. And so Tor has grappled uh, with this issue, and as a society, we have grappled with it. And by and large, we've concluded that it's better for the world that the technology exists than it doesn't. And in fact, one of the main funders of Tor is the US State Department. They're interested in it because Tor helps dissidents in other countries who might be fighting oppressive governments and so on. And in fact, recently, there was a news story about the FBI having a successful string of uh, sting operations against uh, people using Tor for child pornography. And so, of course, we have to remember there is a level above the technology uh, that law enforcement can exploit, a variety of uh, uh, ways to uh, uh, get to uh, people who are using uh, these systems for bad purposes, and so it preserves a sense of balance. So let's uh, switch gears a little bit once more. Let's look at the uh, history of anonymous eCash. Even though with Bitcoin these uh, questions are quite controversial and uh, there are debates about how anonymous exactly Bitcoin is and what are the options and so on, this is not, not the first time that we have thought about anonymous cryptocurrencies at a technical level. These efforts have quite a long history. In fact, all the way back in 1982, more than two decades ago, cryptographer David Chom proposed something called blind signatures that helped him develop anonymous electronic cash. So what are blind signatures? Blind signatures are a two-party protocol. Two parties communicate with each other, and at the end of that, one party has produced a digital signature of some input without actually knowing what that input is. I know it sounds a little bit like magic, but I encourage you to look it up. It's not that sophisticated at a technical level. It's, uh, uh, it's quite simple to understand if you work through the details, but since I'm not um, actually going to go into the details now, let's uh, for the moment assume that it, this works by magic. So assuming that we have blind signatures, how can that help us achieve an electronic cash protocol? That's what David Chom did. And as we go through this protocol, try to see if you can uh, spot any other flaws with it other than uh, the anonymity properties or lack thereof. It's quite a simple protocol. I'm going to show it to you in just one slide. Now, imagine that there is a bank, and this is a protocol for anonymous eCash through blind signatures. Imagine that there is a bank, and the bank stores various things in its database. In particular, it stores these two tables. The first table has a mapping of users with the balance that they have in their bank account. These balances don't refer to any sort of cryptographic currency. It's just a plain old number sitting in a database, just like your actual bank account or PayPal or something like that. In addition, it has another table called spent coins, and you'll see in a moment what this means. Let's say that a user now wants to withdraw an anonymous coin from the system. And now this is where the crypto magic is going to come in. 
So the user wishes to withdraw an anonymous coin of a standard denomination. Let's say that that's a $1 denomination and all of these values refer to dollars. So the first thing that the bank is going to do on receiving this request is deduct this user's balance that's gone down from 10 to 9 in this example. The next thing the user and the bank are going to do together is execute a two-party protocol, a blind signature protocol, at the end of which the user, having picked a random serial number of a coin, that's what's being depicted here. This is a serial number for an anonymous coin, and the user was completely at liberty to pick that number. She did, and then they executed a protocol, at the end of which the user has received a signature of this serial number, but in such a way that the bank did not in fact learn the serial number. The bank had no idea what number it was signing. It just knew that it was uh, some number that it signed. Right. And now this uh, signed number represents an anonymous token. This is a token that the user can pass around to another user. So let's say that she wants to make a payment to another user. What she'll do is send to that user not only the signed token, but also the plain text value of the token of the serial number. And what the receiving user will do immediately is the following. She will immediately contact the bank and try to deposit this anonymous coin. Because without actually trying to deposit it, this red user here cannot be sure that this blue user is not trying to double spend. The blue user could be sending that same anonymous coin to 100 different users. How can they know that they're not being tricked into accepting a double spend coin? The way they're sure is when the red user receives the coin, uh, they have to immediately contact the bank to verify if it's valid or not. And only if the coin turns out to be valid uh, will the red user proceed to complete the rest of whatever transaction she was having with the blue user. So the bank now receives the message to deposit the coin and note that it now gets finally the plain text serial number as well as its own signature. The bank looks at the signature verifies that it's a valid signature. And here's the key thing. It also verifies that the serial number that it received is not on the list of spent coins. That's how it knows that this is not a double spend attempt. This is the legitimate first spend of a coin that the bank signed before. So it's a legitimate anonymous token. And since the bank didn't see the serial number the first time around, the bank does not know which user initially withdrew this anonymous coin. And that's the key anonymity property. In the period of time between the blue user withdrawing this coin and then perhaps much later sending it to the red user who immediately deposits the coin, many other pairs of users might have deposited and uh, withdrawn coins and the bank has no way to tell them apart. So coming back to this uh, part of the protocol, the bank verifies that this is a new serial number that it's seeing for the first time. It puts that serial number into its list of spent coins so that it cannot be spent anymore and adds one dollar uh, or whatever the denomination is to Red's account and then sends back a message saying this is okay. And now the Red user has verified that they received a legitimate anonymous coin from the blue user and can now proceed to complete the transaction. Right. So this is the entirety of a very simple anonymous electronic cash scheme and the key property here is that the bank uh, cannot link the two users. So I asked you to think about whether this has any uh, drawbacks other than anonymity and of course the glaring thing that you probably noticed is that all of this depends upon trusting this bank. I mean look at this part of the system. This is simply the bank uh, keeping numbers in its database of uh, who owns how much money. Right. So this, is, this seems to be a trust model that's very, very different uh, from the model that Bitcoin operates under. So a lot of the traditional cryptography research on a, a, anonymous eCash was in this model where you were willing to trust a bank for many things, including keeping your money, but you were not willing to trust a bank uh, with, uh, with anonymity. You wanted to be sure that the bank didn't know who was interacting with whom. Okay, it's a... Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting model, it's a valid model, and uh, uh, many such uh, schemes were developed under this model. But in retrospect, it seems to have been that the decentralization problem uh, was a much more important one to solve than the anonymity problem in order for anonymous electronic cash uh, to become successful. People were willing to accept 
a decentralized eCache system with only sort of pseudonymity properties and not real anonymity, and then get to work on maybe improving the anonymity instead of starting from a fully provably anonymous electronic cache system that uh, relied on a single central authority. But more generally, anonymization and decentralization, as we'll see uh, repeatedly in this lecture, are in conflict with each other. There are at least a couple of reasons for this. One is that, as we saw in the last slide, often for anonymity, you might want to rely on certain interactive protocols with a bank in order to uh, do some blinding, uh, which we saw in blind signatures. That's where you get anonymity from. So, but how are you going to do that without a central bank to carry out that protocol with? It's not clear. But even if you got rid of this blinding and were willing to accept just pseudonymity instead of true anonymity, you still have the problem that in order to decentralize and still get security properties like resistance to double spending, often the way to go is to record and trace everything in a public ledger, as Bitcoin does. And so you might even further compromise your anonymity and privacy properties. So these are two big challenges to overcome. And as we'll see much later in this lecture, uh, zero coin and zero cash are cryptographic, anonymous, decentralized electronic cash schemes that uh, are, have some similarities to the uh, uh, blind signature based protocol that I showed you earlier, but some of the giant challenges that they have to tackle involve uh, these two limitations. All right, I said several times uh, earlier that Bitcoin is only pseudonymous, and so all of your transactions or addresses could get linked together. Let's now go in and see how that might actually happen. Uh, let's in fact start from WikiLeaks again. I showed you a quote from them saying Bitcoin is a secure and anonymous digital currency, and this is actually the page that that was taken from. Uh, this is their donations page. And here you'll see that in addition to this blurb about Bitcoin being secure and anonymous, they have a donation address over here. This is, of course, the hash of a public key. You've seen things like this in previous lectures. But they also have this interesting refresh button right next to that. What do you imagine this refresh button might do? Well, as you might expect, if you click on that refresh button, it'll give you an entirely new donation address. Let's uh, go in and take a look at that. So a totally new address popped up on the page. So what is going on here? What WikiLeaks is doing is it's making sure that each time a person visits the page, each time a person wants to visit uh, the page and make a donation, they send that donation to a totally new public key uh, that uh, WikiLeaks creates just for that purpose. So here, WikiLeaks is taking advantage of the ability to create new pseudonyms, new public keys to the maximum. Every single transaction that they receive, they want to receive it at a new address. And in fact, this is the Bitcoin best practice for anonymity, to always receive new transactions at a fresh address. So you might look at this and think, surely then, these different addresses must be unlinkable. You receive a transaction over here, and then much later you spend it by sending it to somebody else. You receive another transaction at this address, and then you send it to someone else over there. So how might somebody link? Well, here's the key. Uh, let's, uh, let's imagine the scenario. Alice, a customer, uh, goes to a big box store and uh, wants to buy a teapot. So in this scenario, Alice has a few bitcoins lying around with these different denominations, and the store lists the teapot for a price of eight bitcoins. That's a, a pretty expensive teapot at today's exchange rate, so imagine that's uh, centi bitcoins or something, if you like. At any rate, uh, Alice has these different addresses and wants to pay for the teapot. How is she going to accomplish this? She doesn't actually have an address with eight bitcoins sitting in there. And so what she's going to do is she's going to combine several different input transactions into a single transaction uh, in order to pay eight bitcoins to the store. So this reveals something. For somebody who's looking at this transaction that gets recorded permanently in the blockchain, they're going to think, aha, two different inputs to this transaction. That could only happen because both of these input addresses are under the control of the same user, they were able to use their wallet software to create a transaction that combined both of them into one. So, uh, in other words, shared spending is evidence of joint control of two different addresses. And it doesn't stop there. This is not just about linking two different addresses that are inputs to a transaction. 
Uh, you can do that transitively, and every time uh, Alice has a whole cluster of addresses that have been linked, and then she uh, creates a new transaction that combines one of those addresses with a new address, you can add this new address to the cluster. Right. So this is the first insight behind being able to link transactions together. And we'll see later on that an anonymity technique called coin join works by violating exactly this assumption. But if you assume that people are just using regular Bitcoin wallet software, not doing anything special on top of it, then this technique uh, tends to be pretty robust. And uh, this has been explored in a variety of research papers. And uh, as a, just a note about this lecture, a lot of what we're going to be discussing today gets into the frontiers of where the research knowledge are. So a lot of this, the state of the art may have advanced in a few months or a few years. So every time I talk about a technique that we know from a particular research paper, I'll give you a reference to that paper uh, so that you can look it up. You can look up papers that cite it and uh, you can build up that knowledge on your own. Now, in particular, one of the papers that uh, used this technique used it for a particular purpose. Uh, there was a uh, well-publicized Bitcoin theft a few years ago. And uh, what they wanted to do, the authors of this paper decided to see how this thief has been uh, moving Bitcoins around between multiple addresses of his own. And so uh, this is that paper in question. It's called an analysis of anonymity in the Bitcoin system. And so this is one of the first major research efforts that uh, did what we call transaction graph analysis. So you can use the techniques that I showed you in previous slides and uh, you can draw a lot of these pretty graphs and uh, deduce that uh, this represents the thief uh, moving money around between uh, his own different addresses. This is the thief sending money to someone else and uh, various things like that. I haven't yet shown you anything that allows you to link any of these clusters to real world identity, but uh, let's defer that question for a bit. Let's defer that question and uh, go back to the scenario of Alice and the teapot. So let's look at it again. Maybe the teapot has gone up in price to 8.5 uh, centi bitcoins. So what is Alice going to do now? She can't combine any subset of her transactions or her addresses to produce uh, the exact amount of change necessary for purchasing this teapot. So instead, what she's going to do is exploit the fact that transactions can have any number of inputs and outputs and create a single transaction that looks like this. It combines these two inputs to produce this output that goes over here and another output that goes to an address that she herself owns. And uh, this is called a change address, uh, which you saw in a previous lecture. But this presents a conundrum uh, for an adversary who's looking at this. The adversary might be able to deduce that these two addresses belong to the same user. He might suspect that one of these addresses also belongs to that same user, but has no way of knowing which one that is. In this particular example, the change address is a small amount, but it doesn't have to be that way at all. Alice might own an address that has 10,000 bitcoins uh, and might spend a little bit on the teapot and uh, might send most of the rest of it back to her and her own change address. And these transaction outputs don't have any particular ordering in the, back chain, the, uh, in the blockchain. That order is not meaningful at all. So it's not clear what the adversary might do. It's not clear how the adversary might determine which addresses change in a multi-output transaction. So what is the adversary to do? There's another pretty cool technique for this, again, from uh, a research paper, which I'll tell you about. But the technique is this. Uh, they, the authors call this idioms of use, and they exploit idiosyncratic features of different wallet software. Uh, for example, one thing they found is that most wallet software uh, use an address as a change address only once. That means that uh, uh, this, in fact, seems to sort of follow Bitcoin best practice for anonymity, in a sense. Uh, if you have uh, uh, a new transaction where you need to create a new change address, don't use an address that you've already used before as a change address. Create a new address and use it for this purpose. Right. Now, not all addresses that are outputs of uh, transactions might have this property. Uh, going back to the example of the big box store, the store might advertise a long-term address at which it wants to receive Bitcoins instead of receiving Bitcoins at a different address every time. So not every non-change address has this property that it's used only once as, an, as, uh, as a change address, but every change address does have that property. So they used this and they found that it works pretty well. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this has some limitations. It's, uh, it just happens to be a feature of wallet software. Uh, 
And so there are a lot of uh, false positives that might creep in uh, to these clustering techniques if you use techniques like this. So it required a lot of manual intervention. Nevertheless, they were able to use the technique that I showed you before, which is uh, clustering shared inputs together, as well as uh, a few heuristics for change address detection. And then what they were able to do is they were able to look at the entire Bitcoin transaction graph and create some giant clusters that they hypothesized belonged to various major service providers. And here's what that graph looks like after applying these two heuristics. And uh, this is the paper in question. This is by uh, Sarah Mickeljohn and others uh, as a, a whole bunch of authors of this paper. Now, this graph looks very interesting here. The sizes of these circles represent the amount of money flowing into those clusters. And the number of edges going out of a cluster represent the number of transactions. Let's try to just stare at this for a second and uh, see if we can guess what some of these major service providers and other clusters of nodes might be. This huge one here that dominates in transaction volume compared to any other cluster, given that this paper was uh, written in 2013, we might guess that it's Mt. Gox, which was a very prominent exchange of the time at the time that later went under. Uh, we might also guess that this uh, little one here that only has a little bit of transaction volume in spite of having a very large number of transactions sort of corresponds to the profile of uh, the gambling service, Satoshi Dice, because the way that it works is you send a tiny amount of Bitcoins and uh, uh, you either win that bet or you lose that bet. And so you might get double the Bitcoins or none of the Bitcoins. Uh, so that's the gambling service, Satoshi Dice. We might guess that it's this one here. We might guess that it's Mt. Gox and so on. But uh, this kind of guessing is suboptimal. The authors wanted some sort of reliable way of identifying what are the service providers corresponding to each of these clusters. How did they do that? Well, one idea you might have is you might think, oh, why not just go to the Mt. Gox website and see what address they advertise for receiving Bitcoins? Well, that doesn't quite work because they're going to advertise a new address for every single transaction. And if you just go to the website, look at the address and actually don't complete that transaction, you don't send Bitcoins there, then they're simply going to discard that address. They're not going to reuse that address for another customer. In other words, that address will never get used. You simply won't find it in the blockchain. So what's the way around this? Well, the only way to reliably infer addresses that are associated with a service provider is to actually transact with that service provider, which is exactly what the authors did. They, uh, they went ahead and bought a variety of things and interacted in a variety of other ways with uh, uh, a bunch of service providers comprising 344 transactions in all. Mining pools, wallet services, exchanges, various merchants, even gambling sites, and so on. And uh, they got a bunch of cool things to show for their efforts. And uh, Mickeljohn informs me that, in fact, uh, the cupcakes were really good. At any rate, uh, the authors used this very clever technique to go ahead and label the major clusters in the, ca in the graph that I showed you on the previous slide. And so this is what the labeled graph looks like. Uh, in fact, this was Mt. Gox, as we might have guessed. This was Satoshi Dice, but a lot of the others would have been very difficult to guess. And by actually transacting with these services, they were able to identify most of these service providers. So already now, we've seen something pretty interesting beyond just clustering and being able to put labels on the clusters. So the next question is, sure, you can do these labels for these major service providers. Can you put labels for individuals? In other words, connect little clusters corresponding to individuals to their real life identities. Well, there's a, at least a couple of different ways in which that can happen. Uh, one is intuitively uh, what I told you right at the beginning. You could simply interact at a coffee shop or with some other merchant. So they learn uh, some transaction or some address that corresponds to you, and they might use that to tag your cluster. There are at least a couple of other ways uh, in which this might happen. And one is that there's uh, high centralization in these service providers. So the intuition here is that uh, most users in the course of normal usage of Bitcoin over a period of months or years are going to interact with at least one of those major service providers that were labeled in the previous graph. So if somebody wants to identify a, uh, a cluster corresponding to a particular user, there's a very high chance that they're going to be able to identify a transaction that ties that cluster with a known labeled cluster. And then they can go to that service provider and if they have the appropriate authority, subpoena that service provider, or if they're a hacker, try to hack into that service provider, and so on. 
And so this is one major avenue in which regular users can get de-anonymized because they eventually inevitably interact with one of these major easily identified service providers. Another one is uh, simply carelessness. A lot of uh, users end up posting uh, address information uh, in forums. Uh, they might uh, post one of the Bitcoin addresses that they own, uh, for example, uh, to receive donations when they're posting comments on forums. Now, uh, that might be because uh, these users are not worried about getting de-anonymized. It could also be because they don't realize that uh, posting one of their addresses is almost going to inevitably allow somebody to connect all of their different addresses together. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that there are clever ways that an attacker might utilize in order to not only link different addresses or transactions belonging to a user, but go from there to real world identity. And our experience, our history of these de-anonymization algorithms shows that they only get more powerful with time and more auxiliary information, as we call it, for attackers to utilize in order to link uh, together to, to get to users' identities. So this is something to worry about if you care about privacy. Before we look at how to make things better for anonymity, let's look at uh, a completely different way in which users can get de-anonymized. So far, what we've looked at is all based on what is available to the attacker in the blockchain, right? the part that is uh, permanently and publicly recorded. But recall that that's not the only part of Bitcoin. There's also a peer-to-peer -peer network in which a lot of messages are sent around that don't necessarily get permanently recorded in the blockchain. So the blockchain in networking terminology is called the application layer, and uh, the peer-to-peer -peer network is, of course, the networking layer. And so de-anonymization can happen at this totally different layer, at the networking layer. Well, how could that happen? Uh, here's an example. This was first uh, uh, pointed out by Dan Kaminsky uh, a few years ago in a talk at Black Hat. Here's the peer-to-peer -peer network. What he noticed is that uh, when a node creates a transaction and wants to broadcast it, it's going to connect to a lot of nodes at once and broadcast that transaction and so if uh, a few nodes on the network put their heads together, they can figure out that, hey, this new transaction, this is the first we heard of it, and all of us first heard of it from this particular node. So this must be the node, this must be the IP address corresponding to the user who created this transaction. So here you have a linkage uh, not between a transaction uh, or a cluster and a real world identity. Instead, you have a linkage between a transaction and IP address. And of course, IP address is something that's very close to a real world identity. Uh, there are a lot of ways to go from there to the next level of finding identity. So this is already a serious problem. Uh, luckily though, uh, this is not a very hard problem to solve. Why? Because this is now a problem of communications anonymity and communicating anonymously is a problem that has received a lot of attention from the research community. And as we already saw in the introduction, uh, there is a good system called Tor uh, that you can use for communicating anonymously. Now, there's one little caveat. Tor is intended for what is called low latency activities, such as web browsing, where there is a large volume of flow and uh, you don't want to sit around waiting for too long and you get the response immediately. So it makes some compromises in anonymity in order to achieve low latency. Bitcoin is inherently a high latency system, right? Because it takes a while for transactions to propagate through the network and especially to get confirmed in the blockchain. So we don't have this low latency constraint. So it's possible that we could come up with a more specific uh, fine-tuned uh, sort of anonymity network for this particular purpose. And there are such thing things called mixnets the only problem is that Tor is the system that's uh, most widely deployed and analyzed and robust and functional today. But it's possible that somebody might develop a mixnet solution for anonymizing your Bitcoin communications. And uh, if that happens, uh, that would be something to switch to. So let's summarize what we've learned so far. We've seen that based on the information in the blockchain, different addresses could get linked together, could also get linked to identity. We've also seen that based on the information at the network layer, a transaction or address could get linked to your IP address. Luckily, this latter problem is simple to solve. If you care about your anonymity and privacy when using Bitcoin, it's a good idea to do it through Tor. Uh, but the former problem is much trickier, and that's what we're going to spend the rest of this lecture talking about. So 
There are a variety of solutions to uh, inhibit what uh, we've been calling transaction graph anonymization or transaction graph analysis, pardon me. And the first of them is called mixing. So what is mixing? Well, the intuition behind this is very, very simple. Uh, it's the same intuition uh, that comes up in a lot of contexts, which is that if you want anonymity, use an intermediary to route your communications or your funds or whatnot. So let's look at what that might look like visually. Here's an intermediary, and in a second we'll get to who these intermediaries might be. But assume that there is some intermediary, some service, that allows users to put in bitcoins, but the key property that it gives you is that after these bitcoins have been put in, it forgets who put them in and treats its entire store of bitcoins as uh, indistinguishable from each other. And in fact, it might further combine them all into uh, one uh, giant transaction, or it might further mix them or uh, split them and merge them in different ways, whatever. But the key property is that when users later come in to withdraw their bitcoins, it's not tied to the coin that they put in. They're going to get uh, some other, say, randomly picked uh, deposit that the, uh, that the intermediary received. So when these three users come back, they're going to withdraw these coins in a random order. And so somebody looking at this in the blockchain who doesn't have the records that the intermediary might or might not store just from the publicly available information in the blockchain is not going to be able to link the ultimate input addresses to the ultimate output addresses corresponding to the same user. So that's the intuition behind intermediaries. Now, looking at this, does that uh, strike a chord? Have, have we seen in previous lectures something that offers uh, services that are similar to this, that allows you to deposit bitcoins and then withdraw them later at a later time? You might recall that this is exactly what online wallets do. There are services where you can just uh, store your bitcoins online uh, until you need them. And so you might wonder, well, is that the solution to our problems? Do online wallets provide anonymity? Let's think about that. The answer to this is not obvious, uh, but I will start by mentioning that uh, it's uh, uh, taken well-known researchers by surprise. Here was, um, here was a post on the New York Times Bits blog reporting on a preprint of a paper released by two Israeli researchers saying that there was a link between Dread Pirate Roberts, the pseudonymous creator of Silk Road, which uh, we're gonna see more about, and Satoshi Nakamoto. This was, uh, of course, very surprising. Uh, but as it turned out, all that had happened was that they had uh, mistook this uh, link that went through an intermediary, and that intermediary just turned out to be Mt. Gox, which you can uh, think of sort of as an online wallet service. And uh, uh, so a few days later, this other post was published at the same menu. See if you can spot the difference. They had to uh, retract their study, and uh, I think they had made a, a very simple mistake of not accounting for the presence of this intermediary. So it's clear that at least in some sense, online wallets provide some sort of anonymity because at least somebody tried to make a connection between an input and an output address and uh, completely failed at that. So let's try to uh, understand exactly the sense in which online wallets provide anonymity. And I think a good way to do that would be to in fact contrast online wallets with the online services that exist specifically for the purpose of acting as these intermediaries for anonymity. And those are going to be dedicated mixing services. We'll talk about mixing services in much more detail, but very briefly, uh, the two things that they promise that you won't get simply by putting your Bitcoins into an online wallet and retrieving that again, is that they promise not to keep records. It's not just that as a side effect, they sort of randomly uh, give you Bitcoins that came from some other address, but they specifically say that they won't keep records. And so even if they tried to, uh, they wouldn't know which Bitcoins were the ones you put in. And so with a high probability, you're going to get some other Bitcoins back. And furthermore, even if someone came knocking for their records or if they got hacked and so on, there would be nothing to find. There would be no records. So that's something that a mixing service promises. And the other thing is that you don't need your real life identity in order to interact with these services. And this is in contrast to most of these online wallets. Why? Because online wallets are typically reputable and in fact often regulated businesses. And this fact has two consequences. One is that they'll typically require your identity. In banking, there is the know your customer principle which essentially at a technical level translates to uh, learn the customer's identity and store those records. 
And in fact, they will keep records. If they receive a, a deposit, they will keep the link between the identity and the Bitcoin address. If they move money around internally, they will probably keep records of all of that. And just because when you withdraw your Bitcoins, they come from a different address, does not mean does the, that the online wallet does not know the link. That link probably does exist in their records and will exist for all eternity. Even if they don't explicitly ask for your identity, think about this. To even interact with an online wallet, you do need a persistent long-term identity. You can't possibly use a different pseudonym every time, because if you did, they'd have no way of associating an account with you, of knowing uh, how many Bitcoins they owed you. Right? So because of that, even if they didn't ask for your identity, at the very least, the online wallet knows the address of every single deposit that you made of the Bitcoins uh, that you put into the system, and more importantly, every single withdrawal that you made. And so when you make a series of withdrawals from an online wallet and proceed to spend those Bitcoins, the wallet service can now uh, connect all of those together in a profile. And of course, it's not just the wallet service. Uh, people who care about anonymity are also worried about those records getting hacked, uh, insider attacks, somebody who uh, has a subpoena for uh, getting those records and so on and so forth. So with respect to the wallet service itself and whoever they might be cooperating with, you have no anonymity in this context. On the other hand, there is something cool about this. If you are willing to trust them with your Bitcoins, then what's going to happen is you're going to keep them in the wallet service for much longer than you typically would with a mixed service. Why? Because you don't trust a mixed service as much. You want to put in your Bitcoins and you want to receive it back immediately from some other address uh, at, a, at uh, an address of your choosing. Right? So unlike that, for an online wallet service, you're going to have a bigger anonymity set. Why? Because your anonymity set, from the point of view of someone with no privileged information, from the point of view of someone who's merely looking at the blockchain, your withdrawal could uh, look indistinguishable from every single withdrawal uh, ever made uh, from that service provider. So with respect to the wallet service, you have no anonymity. With respect to everybody else, uh, you have a bigger anonymity set than you possibly would with using a mixing service, or at least with using a single mixing service. So if we look at this, this looks suspiciously similar to the kind of privacy properties that you have with the traditional banking system. There are these centralized intermediaries that know a lot about our transactions. But from the point of view of a stranger with no privileged information, we have a pretty good amount of privacy. So even if this gives you some sort of anonymity, it's uh, almost at best what you get with the traditional system. And so those are not the kind of people who are typically looking for uh, anonymity in Bitcoin anyway. If they were happy with the anonymity properties of the traditional system, they would have uh, probably stayed with that system. And so generally, people who are looking for anonymity properties in Bitcoin uh, simply do not want to accept the trust requirements that these online services, uh, online wallet services uh, require and uh, uh, they don't want the sort of anonymity properties that it gives you. They don't want to have to trust that service with, uh, with their anonymity. And in fact, we've seen that there have been a lot of closures of these exchanges and services, and so there's good reason for believing that uh, if you put all your trust in an online service, you might simply lose your money. Okay, so having rejected online wallets as an anonymity solution, let's turn to these dedicated mixing services that I told you a little bit about. Before looking at their details, let's talk about the terminology a little bit. I, I like to call it a mix. Some people call it a mixer. Uh, these are really the same thing. Some people also call them laundries. I don't like this term at all. And the reason for this is that it needlessly attaches moral meaning to something that's a purely technical term. As we've seen earlier, there are very good reasons why you might want to protect your privacy in Bitcoin and use mixes for entirely good reasons for everyday privacy. Of course, we must also acknowledge the bad uses, but it seems a little bit weird to me to use the term laundry that implies that your coins are dirty and you need to clean them and uh, attaching a negative moral value to the whole thing, uh, which, uh, and for that reason, I'm not going to use that term in this lecture. We'll go with the technically neutral term, which is mixing. So in talking about mixing, uh, there are several of us, about six of us, who got together, researchers at Princeton, Concordia, and Maryland, including all four of us who are doing this online lecture series, 
and analyze the existing Mix ecosystem and uh, propose a series of changes for improving the way that Mixes operate, both in terms of anonymity and the trustworthiness of Mixes. So uh, let's look at those principles before I show you those principles as a quick reminder at a very fundamental level, how does a mix operate? It uh, asks for an address at which you want to receive Bitcoins and it gives you an address uh, to send Bitcoins to the mix. And then you both execute that transaction. Uh, it's a swap basically. In a second, I'll show you what that looks like visually. But what were our principles for running these mixes properly? Well, the very first one is that you might want to use a series of mixes instead of just a single mix. And this is a very well-known principle. Uh, using a series of routers is the same principle in the anonymous communication system Tor. And uh, it's a good idea because it allows you to uh, not have to uh, trust a single mix, but instead be sure that as long as any one of these mixes is uh, promising to delete its records, uh, then you have a good guarantee of anonymity. And in particular, mixes should implement a standard API so that this can be uh, very easy for clients to accomplish. And right now, this is not quite the case. And uh, this, this is our paper for your reference. So now let's go in and uh, look at what a series of mixes would look like visually. So here it is. Here is a user who starts with uh, a, a coin or an input address that uh, uh, we assume that the adversary has managed to link to this particular user. They're going to send it to the mix at this address and get back a Bitcoin at this other output address that they provide. They freshly generate this output address and provide that address to the mix. The mix will hopefully return the same amount of Bitcoins at this output address. Uh, there's no way for the user to force the mix to do that. The user has to trust the mix. And this is, as we'll see, a recurring problem uh, with the whole notion of mixes. And either immediately or after a time gap, it doesn't matter, uh, the user will take the Bitcoin or Bitcoins of whatever uh, value they've received at this address and send it to a different mix, which is hopefully not cooperating with the first mix, and repeat this process over and over again. So from an adversary's point of view, looking at the public blockchain, they're merely going to see, along with all of these transactions, a variety of other mixed transactions that other users are executing. And we'll, hopefully, the adversary will have no way to tell apart which of those transactions correspond to this particular user and which one corresponds to some other users. So that's the first principle. And the second one, if uh, you think about what I've just said, in order to make that possible, you want to make these transactions as uniform as possible uh, so that this linkability is minimized. And what does it mean to tr make these transactions as uniform as possible? One important consequence is that all of these mixed transactions, not only from a particular mix, but all of the mixes in this mix, e mix ecosystem should have the same value. So we think that all mixes out there providing service should agree upon a chunk size, a standard chunk size. And of course, there can be multiple denominations, but there can't be too many. And you can't simply allow the users to uh, put in whatever amount of uh, uh, Bitcoins they wish to. That wouldn't work. So you need this kind of standardization. In addition to this, we found that there are a variety of possible attacks in which a clever adversary uh, might uh, infer various things, uh, not just the amount, even if you remove the amount, uh, some other properties, including timing, for example, in order to try to link users' input addresses and output addresses together. This type of linking can be avoided, but human users, if they interact with the mix, are not going to be uh, able to take into account all of those possible linking attacks. So instead, what needs to be done is this client-side software must be automated and built into desktop wallet software so that this desktop wallet software automatically knows how to interact with these mixes in order to preserve the user's anonymity. So that was our third principle. Our fourth principle is a subtle one. Now, these mixes, why do they provide these, uh, this service? Typically, it's because they're a business. And if they're a business, they want to be paid. How are they going to get paid? Well, it turns out that uh, pretty much the only way for these mixes to get paid is to take a cut of the transaction that the user is sending to the mix. That seems uh, a bit weird uh, because uh, if a mix takes a standard percentage, then an adversary might be able to use that to link the input transaction and the output transaction. So some current mixes try to randomize the transaction fee. Uh, they might say, we take a random cut between 1% and 3%. We found that this is not a good idea either, because if you put that through a chain of mixes, uh, 
then uh, the amount of the value in the chunk is going to dwindle in a predictable way, and this is an important side channel for the adversary. So what is a way to avoid this? We proposed that these mixed fees should be all or nothing. In other words, the mix should either swallow the whole chunk with a small probability or should return the whole chunk. So if the mix wants to charge a 0.1% mixing fee, this is, by the way, very different from the transaction fee that uh, uh, mining nodes charge. This is a mixing fee on top of that. So if the mix wants to charge a 0.1% mixing fee, then uh, one out of a thousand times, the mix should swallow the entire chunk. And 999 times out of a thousand, the mix should return the entire chunk without taking any mixing fee. This is a tricky property to accomplish, which means that uh, the mix should generate a random number in a way that uh, can convince the user that uh, the mix is not cheated in generating this random number and has genuinely uh, flipped a coin, which has uh, you know, a 99.9% .9 chance of coming up one way uh, versus the other. But we do show how to, how to do this using cryptography in a way that both parties can be satisfied has worked correctly. We think that really all four of these principles are necessary to have anything approaching mathematical confidence in having a large anonymity set and in our ability to resist clever inferential attacks by an adversary that looks at the blockchain to try to link input to output. The sad news is that virtually none of the current mixes follow these principles. They're in a very different model where each mix operates completely independently and they have a web interface and the user interacts with them totally manually instead of automatically through their wallet software and will manually put in the amount instead of a standard chunk size it's uh, whatever amount the user chooses typically and uh, the mix will take uh, some cut of that as a mixing fee and send the rest to the user so this is we don't think this is a situation that gives mix users a lot of anonymity but we think that by moving to uh, a slightly different model based on these four principles, the anonymity properties of the mix ecosystem can be dramatically improved. All right, so through these four principles, we've seen how the anonymity properties of mixing can be improved, but there is still one major problem, which is that users still have to trust these mixes. So again, we had a few ways that we talked about in our paper uh, for what to do about this. Uh, mixes can do several things to improve their uh, trustworthiness. One is that simply by staying in business for a long time and not stealing users' money, uh, they can build up a reputation. You might wonder, does this reputation count for anything? Because it's simply a matter of he said, she said. Uh, in fact, a mix operator can uh, claim that a competing mix operator uh, stole all their money, even if that did not in fact happen. Well, Generally, reputation systems in the real world manage to operate even though there can be conflicting claims that are made. In this context, for example, uh, users might learn to only trust the word of prominent members of the Bitcoin community who they think have the best interests of the ecosystem at heart. Another way is that in the system that we proposed, the chunk sizes are going to be so small that in the regular course of mixing, users are going to mix a pretty huge number of chunks or at least the system can be configured in that way so that the chunk sizes are relatively small. So in that context, if a mix has even a 1% probability of stealing a user's chunk, then after 100 or so interactions with small chunk sizes with a particular mix, the user is going to know, the user is going to detect the theft, and so the user will learn to never use this mix again. And so the system might sort of correct itself by users uh, testing mixes for themselves for trustworthiness. An important thing to keep in mind here is that the chunks that users are sending to mixes have typically already been through other mixes. So the mix itself can't know which user the chunk is coming from. And so the only thing the mix can do is to essentially steal randomly from users. The mix can't steal from a particular user. So from the user point of view, on average, they won't suffer losses that are more than the average rate at which the mix steals. So they don't have to worry that a mix might uh, particularly have it in, a, in it for that particular user and steal all of their money. There's no way that that can happen. So that's what I mean when I say users can test this for themselves. And finally, we proposed a cryptographic mechanism where the mix can issue sort of a, a promissory statement to the user 
that once it receives a chunk at a particular address, it will send a chunk back at some other address that the user provides. And so if the mix fails to keep this promise, our idea is that the user can publicize this warranty and everybody will know that a particular mix is cheated. And so everybody will stop using this mix and the mix will lose business. And in combination, all of these three mechanisms uh, provide incentives for mixes to act honestly. So these were our calculations anyway in our proposal. Uh, we haven't proved that this will work in practice. That remains to be seen. All right, um, let's, uh, on that note, let's quickly look at how things are in practice right now. It doesn't seem that there are any reputable services providing dedicated mixing that users have learned to trust uh, or at least enough to use on a regular basis. In fact, this is from the Bitcoin Wiki where uh, the original is also highlighted in red, so I took the liberty of doing that myself. Mixing services may themselves be operating with anonymity, and so uh, if your funds are not delivered, you have no recourse, use at your own discretion. So we're proposing moving to a different model where uh, mixes stay in business, become reputable entities and so on. That hasn't quite happened yet. And note that there is sort of a bootstrapping problem here. If mixes were reputable entities, they would have a big volume of transactions. And so by interacting with them, you'd get a pretty good anonymity set. And so users would be more confident in interacting with them and mixes would realize that they're making more money by staying in business and taking a small cut than by trying to steal uh, the small amount of money that uh, they're controlling at any given time. And so uh, mixes would be further incentivized to stay in business. So you can imagine that once a mix ecosystem gets going, it will be self-sustaining. Uh, but whether or not that can eventually happen, we can say for sure that it hasn't quite happened yet. So the fact that uh, this mix ecosystem currently doesn't exist is a big part of the reason why uh, many people have proposed decentralized mixing. And there are a variety of reasons for decentralized mixing, some of which we've talked about, in that there is no bootstrapping problem. So the reason there's no bootstrapping problem is that in decentralized mixing, you don't go through a particular dedicated mix service. Instead, you find a community of peers who all want to do mixing. And somehow, without any central coordination, or at least a central service that collects your funds, you manage to mix with each other. So that avoids the bootstrapping problem because as long as there is enough interest from Bitcoin users, they can meet with each other and start mixing. How to do that, we'll see in a second. Also, theft is impossible, uh, and this is enforced through technical means because nobody is explicitly sending Bitcoins uh, to another user. Again, we'll see how, how this is accomplished. It could possibly provide better anonymity, and we'll look into more details on that as well. And finally, I just want to point out that this is just more philosophically aligned with Bitcoin. If you can get rid of having to have a centralized service for some purpose, then there are a lot of users who are Bitcoin users who find that appealing. So how might this work? The main proposal for decentralized mixing is called a coin join. And uh, this is something that was proposed by Greg Maxwell, who's a core Bitcoin developer, who we'll meet again in the next lecture, actually. So what he proposed is different users coming together to create a single Bitcoin transaction. And what are the outputs of this transaction? We'll see in a second. But somehow, create a single Bitcoin transaction that combines all of their inputs, uh, presumably of equal value. Now let's think about this for a second. What is necessary in order for these three users to create a single transaction? Well, one way of thinking about it, we might imagine that in order to produce a signature, somebody has to collect all three private keys. That's not actually how it works though. In Bitcoin, all the signatures corresponding to the different inputs are totally separate. So each input signature is entirely separate. So what it allows the users to easily do is create different inputs that correspond to different users and also different output addresses that correspond to different users and randomize the order between them. So in this situation, maybe the users participating in the protocol might necessarily have to know uh, which input address corresponds to which output address, although we'll see in a second if we can avoid that as well. But certainly someone looking at the blockchain, looking at only this single transaction, even if they realize that this is a coin join transaction, will not be able to find the mapping between the input and the output. It's that simple. That's the essence of CoinJoin. Of course, this is just one round of mixing. 
On top of this, you have to apply the same principles that we talked about before. So the principles that I discussed, they're not only for centralized mixes, uh, they apply essentially with uh, very few modifications even to the coin join scenario. So you want to do a sequence of coin joins, you want to make sure that these chunk sizes are standardized so that uh, you don't introduce new side channels, etc, etc. Okay, but let's uh, look into the single transaction though. Exactly how would this work? There are a lot of details that are still not clear. So let's look at this in algorithmic form. So if we write it out like this, what needs to happen is that a group of peers who all want to mix somehow need to find each other. That's the first difficulty. And then they have to exchange their input and output addresses with each other. And one of these users, it doesn't matter who, will construct this transaction not yet a signed transaction, but just the uh, transaction that corresponds to these different inputs going to these different outputs. And then they'll pass it around to collect signatures from each of the peers. Now, if uh, the peer who constructed the transaction uh, were disruptive and, uh, for example, left out one of the peer's outputs, then the whole thing will collapse because when that particular peer gets the transaction uh, in order to sign it, uh, they will simply refuse to sign and uh, uh, the process will not be able to go forward. But if everything is okay, everybody acts honestly, then the transaction is constructed and now any period, again, doesn't matter who, can broadcast the transaction to the network. Uh, two of them could do it independently, it doesn't matter. The transaction will of course be counted only once. So that's it, that's the whole protocol. The entire security property comes from each peer checking that their output address is represented and that their output of course receives at least as much value as uh, one in from their uh, input. So that seems simple enough, uh, but uh, what are the remaining problems here? Well, uh, there are three problems. One is how did this group of peers find each other, right? And the second is that uh, as, as I described in the previous slide, this protocol involves each of these peers finding out the mapping between inputs and outputs, or at least one of those peers. So that seems like a problem. In fact, I want to point out that this is a worse problem for decentralized mixes than for centralized mixes. And why is that? In the centralized mixing case, you could hope that these different mixes are run by entirely different entities who are not colluding with each other. And at least in some cases, these will be reputable real life entities who uh, you would imagine have incentives not to collude with each other uh, because they have uh, different goals or for whatever reason. Again, the reasoning is similar to Tor. You have a variety of different types of uh, people who are running Tor nodes. They don't all have the same incentives. So we imagine that they're not all going to collude with each other and also that they're not all going to get compromised by the same attacker. A similar principle holds for decentralized mixes. And that only works because you know something about the identities of these mixes. So these mixes having known identities and being reputable entities helps anonymity in this case. We don't have that luxury with decentralized mixes because we have no idea who any of these peers are. Right? So it could be a single attacker creating lots of Sybil accounts and accounts in the sense of just creating lots of Sybils and uh, trying to get into every single coin join transaction that's ever carried out in order to learn these input output mappings. And so even if you do a series of coin joins, it might be the case that in each of those coin joins, at least one of the participants was an attacker or was controlled by the same attacker, in which case your entire anonymity is lost. So that seems like a problem. And a third problem, and kind of a tricky one, is denial of service. What does this mean? Well, it could happen that uh, after providing the input-output pairs, one of the nodes disappears and refuses to sign the resulting transaction. So the transaction is not able to proceed forward. And secondly, even after creating the signature, before the transaction can get broadcast to the network and confirmed in the blockchain, one of the nodes who might be malicious might take this input and spend it in some other transaction that's unrelated to this coin join. And so this coin join will look like a double spend attempt and will be rejected by the Bitcoin network. So that's another way in which you can launch denial of service against coin join. So now let's look at what are some possible solutions to each of these three problems. Well, the first one, how to find peers, is, uh, is a very simple solution. It's not, it's not a perfect solution, but uh, people consider this to be somewhat okay. You simply use an untrusted server 
It's uh, sort of like a watering hole where different users can connect and find each other, but the server is not necessarily involved uh, in any way that the users have to trust in running the protocol. Right. And as we're going to see, each of these steps for solving these problems introduces a little bit of engineering complexity. So this already requires a whole peer-to-peer -peer protocol for finding these uh, coin join peers on top of the Bitcoin protocol. And we're going to see similar uh, factors that introduce engineering complexity for solving each of the other problems. So the next one, how do we solve the anonymity problem? Well, uh, there, is, uh, there is a simple straw man solution. Uh, re you can frame the anonymity problem in this way. You need to communicate the set of inputs to all the peers, and also you need to communicate the set of outputs, but break the linkage between the input and the output. Now this becomes a communications anonymity problem instead of a Bitcoin anonymity problem, right? Because it's simply the matter of uh, uh, communicating these output addresses that needs to be unlinked from communication of the input addresses. So a straw man solution to that, since we already have seen Tor a little bit, is simply this. These peers come together, they exchange input addresses, and they disconnect and then reconnect over Tor after, after a while and then exchange the output addresses. So this is pretty simple, but it may not be very robust in practice. Uh, a better solution might be to build a special purpose anonymous routing mechanism for these participants to utilize just for this protocol. And there are things called uh, decryption mix nets that allow you to do exactly that. And uh, such solutions have been proposed. So let's move to the third problem, which is a denial of service attack. Let's think about it this way. What's a traditional solution to a denial of service attack? Well, one possible solution to a denial of service is to make it a little bit expensive for the client uh, to connect to the server and uh, to uh, to receive service. Well, this is not a client-server model, it's a peer-to-peer -peer model, but we can still try to adapt the same principles. And that's the principle behind the first two of the proposed solutions for denial of service. Either a proof of work or a proof of burn. So what do I mean by this? Proof of work is simply repurposing the algorithm behind Bitcoin's proof of work to require each of these peer nodes to do a little bit of computational work before they can join a coin join protocol. And the rationale is that if the adversary is going to disrupt every coin join that exists out there, they're going to be uh, burning a lot of computing power, which will make it very expensive for them. Proof of burn is a similar concept. It's, a, it's also called a fidelity bonds in Bitcoin. It allows you to irreversibly destroy some Bitcoins that you own by sending it to an unspendable address, thereby proving that uh, uh, you've made an, a little bit of an expensive signal in order to get into this system. So that's the rationale between the first two solutions. The second two solutions, next to the third and fourth, also have a similar rationale, which is to identify uh, the uh, malicious participant, one or more malicious participants, who launched the denial of service to kick them out and to run the coin join with the remaining participants. And that could be done if you trust the server a little bit to carry it out. It could also be done in a purely decentralized manner, uh, like this paper called uh, Coin Shuffle Proposed. And they came up with a cryptographic blaming protocol for doing this. And it involves something called uh, zero knowledge, where you learn at least one of the players who misbehaved uh, without necessarily learning much more uh, about what happened. And then the rest of the peers can then uh, uh, redo the protocol. At various points, I've talked about uh, side channels. So let's uh, uh, look at an example of that. And uh, I want to point out that these side channels can be very tricky. Not all the mixing in the world can save you from uh, uh, what I call high level flows that could be identifying. And here's a neat example of this. Let's say user Alice receives a very specific amount of Bitcoins, uh, let's say on a weekly basis as income, and has the habit of always automatically and immediately transferring, let's say 5% of that to her retirement amount. Right? So think about the patterns that will be visible on the blockchain here. No matter what she does to obscure the link between the address at which she receives her income and uh, the address to which she transfers to her retirement account, uh, the patterns here are going to be uniquely identifying because this is a very specific value and uh, uh, the 5% of that is also going to be a specific value. And there's also a timing pattern. Every time uh, money appears here, every time uh, money goes to this address as well. So this is a problem. How do we protect ourselves from this? Uh, 
Uh, well, one suggestion that has been proposed is uh, uh, not only in the context of mixing, but even in the context of regular Bitcoin wallets where users are not even uh, trying to do any mixing is by Mike Kern, and he calls this merge avoidance. Merge avoidance is a very sim simple idea. When uh, users want to do payments, the proposal is that instead of creating a giant transaction that combines as many inputs as necessary in order to pay the entire payment to a single address, why not have a protocol by which the receiver can provide multiple output addresses, as many as necessary, and the sender and receiver can agree upon denominations, and the sender can avoid combining different inputs and can make a variety of different transactions that uh, uh, send money from uh, different input addresses to different output addresses. Right? So this avoids a lot of the problems uh, both of high-level flows because even these multiple input and output addresses cannot be linked to each other, so an adversary might not even be able to observe the fact that this is a high-level flow that this is, that's happening, uh, but also avoids problems like uh, clustering addresses together because of uh, evidence of shared spending. And this is a proposal that uh, uh, one could think about uh, incorporating right now into uh, Bitcoin-based uh, payment flows in order to improve anonymity for everyone. Now let's turn to zero coin and zero cash, which are a completely different approach to Bitcoin anonymity. Uh, the approach is sort of to bake it in at the protocol level, and these are uh, cryptographic heavyweights. And so Azure Coin was first developed by cryptographers at Johns Hopkins, and uh, later on they co started collaborating with other researchers around the world who had been developing a very efficient cryptographic technique that would enable uh, making some of the cryptographic operations in Zero Coin more efficient, and that resulted in Zero Cash. As you'll see, these techniques provide a qualitatively different level of anonymity than mixing solutions that sit on top of Bitcoin. But what's the catch? The problem is that this is not quite backward compatible with Bitcoin. Uh, zero coin and zero cash are going to require altcoins. Technically, it's possible that uh, zero coin can be deployed as what is known as a soft fork of Bitcoin, but the practical difficulties are high enough that uh, this is not really considered feasible. And in fact, the zero coin developers uh, intend to deploy it as an altcoin themselves instead of trying to be compatible with uh, Bitcoin directly. Let's start talking about the details here. Let's uh, review some of the things that I've just said. So ZeroCoin brings protocol level mixing. And uh, being uh, baked into the protocol, uh, what it gives you is a cryptographic guarantee of mixing. What does that mean? You don't need to trust a single mix or even a set of mixes or a set of peers or anybody at all to ensure your anonymity. You just need to rely on the underlying crypto being solid. You don't even uh, need to rely on the miners enforcing this in order to achieve anonymity. It's purely a cryptographic guarantee. So that's really great. That's qualitatively better uh, than what we have uh, so far. And of course, it's not currently compatible with Bitcoin. And uh, here's the paper if you want to look it up. So how does ZeroCoin work? I'm going to introduce a concept called BaseCoin, and I'm taking a few liberties with the presentation here in order to simplify and clarify the concepts. I'm going to do that by mixing some concepts from ZeroCoin and ZeroCash, but toward the end I'll make very clear what the differences are between the two. So like I said, uh, ZeroCoin is an altcoin, and I'm going to call that altcoin BaseCoin. I'm not calling it ZeroCoin because ZeroCoin is something else. It's an extension of this BaseCoin. It's something uh, that sort of sits on top of this altcoin. And the key property that gives you anonymity is that these base coins can be converted into zero coins and back again. And when you do that, it breaks the link between the original base coin and the new base coin. So think of this as a cryptographic mixing system uh, that's provided by the protocol itself. So how might this work? Another way of looking at a zero coin is that it's a cryptographic proof that you owned a base coin, not anymore, but you owned it, and then you made it unspendable. A zero coin is something that allows you to assert that to, say, any miner who might care. And miners can verify these proofs, and that's what gives you the right to later redeem a new base coin in exchange for the zero coin. And the analogy is a little bit like poker chips. So how could that work, and what properties do these proofs need to have in order to enable this? So one challenge is how to construct these proofs, and uh, the other trick is how do you make sure that each proof can be spent only once 
can be used only once to redeem a base coin, because if you don't have that property, then it's going to lead to double spending. So let's see how to do that. It uh, crucially involves a concept called zero-knowledge proofs. What are zero-knowledge proofs? I'm going to tell you at a, uh, a little bit of an intuitive level, so I'm calling it crypto magic again. But what it is, is it's a way for somebody to prove a statement without revealing any other information that leads to that statement being true. A couple of examples are going to make this really clear. You might be able to prove a statement like, I know an input that hashes to this particular value. And notice that if the input that you had picked were long and random, uh, you could, if you did a proof in such a way that you don't actually reveal the input, it won't necessarily allow somebody else uh, to infer what that input is. A more complex version of this is you could say, I know an input that hashes to some hash in a following set uh, of several different possible outputs. And uh, the zero knowledge proofs that zero coin is going to use is something that's very similar to the second category here. Okay. Let's dive in a little bit more. So zero coins are minted. They come into existence by minting. And uh, uh, anybody can do this. And zero coins come in standard denominations. Let's assume for the rest of this that uh, zero coins are worth one base coin each. You could also imagine multiple denominations coexisting. How do you make a zero coin? Uh, we'll, we're going to see that in the next slide. But uh, let me just say for now that uh, minting a zero coin doesn't automatically give it any value. You can't get free money. It only acquires value once you put it onto the blockchain. And so putting it onto the blockchain is going to be about as expensive as the value of that zero coin uh, that you're later going to be able to redeem. So you have some sort of a con conservation principle here. Okay. So here's how specifically in cryptographic terms uh, we mint a zero coin. It's something called a cryptographic commitment. What a cryptographic commitment is, is intuitively you can think of it as uh, you're taking a serial number, a random serial number that you generated, and putting it into an envelope. So this intuitive notion of putting it into an envelope, cryptographically what does that correspond to? What it corresponds to is generating another random secret R which you're never going to make public, and computing the hash of the coin serial number together with this random secret. Now, this is a little bit of a simplification, uh, but, it, but it really uh, helps you understand the properties of the system. So let's go with this description. So what just happened here? You generated arbitrarily, just like you generate Bitcoin uh, public keys, a, a, a serial number for your zero coin. And if it were long and random, hopefully no one else has ever picked that same serial number before. And you also generated this other random number that you're going to keep secret. And intuitively, generating a commitment uh, to the serial number corresponds to putting it in an envelope and sealing it. And mathematically, it happens by computing the hash of the serial number uh, together with this random value. Okay, once you've generated this commitment, what do you do with that? Well, the next step is to put that commitment onto the blockchain. That's when the zero coin sort of becomes real. And uh, uh, doing this requires, in a sense, burning a base coin and making it unspendable. So in concrete terms, how would that work? You've got the blockchain over here. And one of those transactions might be a mint transaction. And if you zoomed in, it would be a transaction that's signed by Alice, who created uh, this uh, zero coin, who minted this zero coin. And what we saw earlier in the structure of transactions is that over here, you would have the recipient's uh, public key or the recipient's address. Instead of that, here you have this cryptographic commitment. And just like before, just like a transaction having a pointer to a previous transaction, uh, the same structure is carried over for zero coin transactions as well. So what has happened here? We've spent this base coin in order to mint the zero coin. And this commitment, the sealed envelope that we've put into the zero coin is what is going to allow us to redeem that zero coin later in exchange for a base coin once again. So how does that work? To spend the zero coin later, you will reveal that serial number that you put inside the envelope. And what miners will do, it's their, their job to verify that the serial number has not been spent before, that the serial number has not been revealed as the number that was put inside some other envelope. That's what prevents double spending in the system.
Next, you'll create a zero-knowledge proof uh, that we just talked about. And specifically, the zero-knowledge proof will say, I know a number r such that the hash of the serial number together with r corresponds to one of the zero coins of the blockchain. And we'll make that statement more mathematically precise in a second. But think about what this says. It doesn't reveal that random number r. But somehow you're proving that you are in possession of that number combined with the serial number that you have just made public will result in the zero coin that was once in the past put onto the blockchain. Right. So for somebody looking at this proof, this is all they need to know to verify that you earlier spent a base coin in order to get to this point. So this now should give you the right to redeem a base coin. But which base coin? And here's where the anonymity property comes in. You can pick an arbitrary uh, zero coin in the blockchain and use that as an input to a new transaction out of which comes a base coin and uh, the miners will allow you to do that. So put a zero coin in, take a zero coin out, but a different zero coin. And all that anybody needs to know is that you have the right to do that because you put in some zero coin in the past. It doesn't matter which zero coin. And you can't do that twice. You can't do uh, a spend twice corresponding to a single mint because the serial number now will become public. And there's only one serial number corresponding to one zero coin. And you only know the serial numbers corresponding to your zero coins and not anyone else's zero coins. Great. So where does the anonymity property comes from? Here's the anonymity property. Since you've kept this random number R secret, and this is what is available on the blockchain, there are a number of hashes or commitments corresponding to the different zero coins that have been put on the blockchain. Even though you've revealed the serial number, not knowing this other random input R, nobody can try to brute force this and guess which of these zero coins corresponded to your serial number. So even after the serial number inside an envelope has been revealed and it's been verified that this serial number was inside one of the envelopes, we still don't know which serial number it is. So this is the sort of magical property that zero knowledge proofs in cryptography give us that uh, you wouldn't get in a real world, physical world, envelope based analogy of this. So the next cool thing about this whole construction is the fact that these proofs are efficient. And I'm putting efficient in quotes here and the, the sense in which they're efficient is that compared to what we know of zero knowledge proofs and have come to expect on them, it's quite an achievement uh, that these proofs are as efficient as they are. However, compared to uh, the efficiency of Bitcoin transactions themselves, uh, these are in fact quite slow. So it occupies a space in between those two. So exactly what I mean by efficient, uh, the reason it's efficient is that it manages to avoid being linear in the number of zero coins on the chain, even though that is what you would expect. Why is that what you would expect? Think about the statement that the spender is proving here. I know a random number r such that either the hash of the serial number with r corresponds to the first commitment or the first hash or the second commitment or any one of these giant number of commitments that reside on the blockchain. Right. So it's a very long statement that the prover is proving. It's a statement whose length is proportional to the number of zero coins on the blockchain. And yet, the proof is much smaller than that. It's not linear. It's only logarithmic in, this, in, the, uh, in the value n here. And uh, uh, that's part of the magic of zero coin. That's what makes it possible to even run the system. All right, moving on, let's talk about zero cash now. Uh, zero cash kind of takes the cryptography uh, sort of to the next level. It uh, uh, uses a cryptographic tool called SNARKs, which we won't get into at all. But uh, the upshot of that, the upshot of the use of these more efficient cryptographic constructions for proofs, is that the efficiency gets to a point where the authors suggest that you can in fact run the whole system without having any base coin. All transactions can be done in this zero knowledge manner. You don't need to have separate expensive transactions that are used only for mixing and a set of regular everyday transactions that you use uh, when you don't want special anonymity properties. That distinction is now gone. The claim is that you can run all of these transactions uh, sort of uh, inside these envelopes. And what I mean by that is the following. All transactions are zero coins. And so zero cash becomes untraceable in a sense because there is no base coin. 
And the reason for that is that splitting and merging of coins are also transactions that are supported in zero cash itself without going to base coin. And in particular, the transaction values, the transaction amounts, you can put those inside the commitments. Those won't be visible on the blockchain anymore. The only thing that the ledger rec records publicly is the existence of these transactions. Uh, you know that Alice put in some transaction, you know much later that uh, Bob redeemed some transaction who might be the same user, might be a different user. But the only people who need to know uh, what the amount is are the sender and receiver of any particular transaction. The miners don't need to know that. If there's a transaction fee, then the miners need to know that fee, but uh, uh, that doesn't really compromise your anonymity property. Right? So the ability to run ZeroCoin in this different configuration, where it's not two different coins anymore, it's not a base coin with a mixed layer on top, but instead an entirely untraceable system of transactions, uh, puts zero cash sort of in the next level when it comes to anonymity because a lot of the possible side channel attacks that were true for mixing, that were true to a certain extent at least for zero coin, are no longer true uh, for uh, zero cash because the transaction amounts will no longer be visible in the public ledger. But that almost sounds too good to be true. A completely untraceable uh, electronic cash system. It is ledger based but the ledger doesn't record anything that might compromise anonymity or privacy. Well, there is one catch. Here's the catch in zero cash. It requires a certain setup process to even set up the system. Specifically, uh, one needs random and secret inputs in order to generate the public parameters. Think of those as public keys, except that these are giant public keys. They're uh, over a gigabyte in size. And not only that, not only is the size a bit of a problem, these secret inputs for the security of the system then have to be securely destroyed so that nobody knows what those secret inputs were that were used in order to generate these public parameters. That seems like a bit of a problem. And the reason that no one can know them is because if somebody knows them, it doesn't mean that they will be able to compromise anonymity, but they will be able to create uh, new zero coins for themselves and nobody will be the wiser, uh, which is also an equally bad problem for the currency. So it's kind of a, an interesting sociological problem here. How could some entity uh, set up the system and then convince everybody that they have securely destroyed uh, the parameters that were, of course, necessary in order to set up the system. So it's not entirely clear how that can be solved. There have been various proposals for it, uh, but at the moment, we don't have a very clear idea of how to go forward on this. So what have we seen so far in all of the different efforts to improve anonymity in Bitcoin? Well, if we put them on a line, as I'll show you in a second, we see that there are five clearly different levels of anonymity uh, that, uh, uh, that we've seen in uh, different uh, proposed solutions. And uh, what are these? So let's look at not only the levels of anonymity that these systems provide, but also the deployability of these systems. Let's start with Bitcoin, which is already here. It's only pseudonymous. It doesn't even aspire to be really anonymous. And we've seen that pretty bad transaction graph analysis are possible. I showed you many beautiful graphs with the clustering of different addresses and in many cases, how to go from those addresses to identities. So not a lot of anonymity provided by Bitcoin. The next level is simply using a single mix sort of in a manual way in which uh, people are doing right now with some of these dedicated mix services. And uh, that still allows you transaction graph analysis because as, a, as you might remember from the four principles that I gave you, if you don't have this automated system that has uniform chunk sizes and so on, a lot of transaction graph analysis is still possible. In addition, you have to worry that this mix might not be trustworthy as storing records and might be sharing them with other people and again, could get hacked, etc. The third level that we saw is a chain of mixes. And this can be in a centralized model or a decentralized model. It doesn't matter, both models give you roughly the same level of anonymity, but uh, where really the anonymity improvement comes in uh, for this one compared to a single mix is that you have these standardized chunk sizes and you have a series of mixes and you have a, a variety of uh, other bells and whistles on top of it, like automated clients and so on. And for this, some side channels are still possible, uh, not as bad as before. Transaction graph analysis is no longer that easy. And you still have to worry about uh, an adversary who might uh, collude with multiple mixes or in the decentralized model, uh, some peers that might be malicious and compromise your anonymity. This is of course perfectly backward compatible with Bitcoin, could be deployed and adopted any day. 
hasn't quite happened yet in a way that we would consider to be truly anonymous. And then we saw zero coin, which is cryptographic mixing baked into the protocol, doesn't depend on anybody uh, promising to destroy their records or anything like that. You just need to trust the math. So that's a whole different level of anonymity. In my opinion, it still has some possible side channels, but it's not as uh, bad as the other mixing-based solutions that we saw where it's not baked into the protocol. And zero coin, of course, as we saw, is an altcoin, so it's not quite Bitcoin compatible in a way that one might hope. And finally, zero cash. The difference between zero cash and zero coin is not so much at a fundamental mathematical level, but because of the fact that you can run zero cash in a configuration where you get rid of the base coin altogether and the efficiency uh, is, not, is not too bad in that, in that uh, configuration. And so what that gives you is untraceability, which is something on top of unlinkability. So that's a new anonymity property. And uh, there really aren't any anonymity attacks that I can think of at least. But uh, the downside, of course, is that not only is an altcoin, uh, but it also has this very tricky setup process that we don't necessarily know how to make progress on. So we've talked a lot about Bitcoin's anonymity in this lecture, but Bitcoin's anonymity becomes even more powerful when combined with other technologies, in particular, anonymous communication technologies. We've talked about Tor a little bit, we've alluded to it several times, but now let's go into more detail. Let's uh, first set up the problem of anonymous communication though. So this is what the system looks like. There are a bunch of senders, there are a bunch of recipients, and messages are routed from senders through recipients uh, through this network over here. And of course, there's going to be an attacker. This attacker, and this is called a threat model, the attacker controls several things. Some of these nodes in red are compromised by the attacker. Some of these edges, some of these links between uh, honest nodes to the network are also controlled by the, the attacker, even if the nodes themselves are not. Similarly, some of the recipient nodes over here and some of these links from the network to the recipient node are also controlled by the attacker. And finally, some of the internal nodes of the anonymous communication network all under the control of the attacker. But crucially, not all of the uh, communication network is controlled by the attacker. And we want to achieve anonymity in this hostile environment. And as before, anonymity refers to unlinkability between the sender and the receiver. So how does Tor accomplish this? It's the uh, same old pattern of picking a chain of intermediaries to route your messages through. And uh, here it is in a nice visual form. And I have to thank the Electronic Frontier Foundation for this slide. So what's going on? Alice over here wants to talk to Bob over here. So she pre-selects a path uh, through this set of routers, and that number is fixed in the Tor protocol, it's always three, but uh, conceptually you can imagine that it would be uh, any number you want, and the more nodes you route through, the more anonymity you get, or the harder it is, I, sh I should say, uh, to breach anonymity. So these nodes denoted with a plus are all the Tor nodes, and sh she picks uh, some subset of three nodes uh, randomly in order to route her message. And the security property that we get is that as long as at least one of these uh, three nodes that she picks is not compromised or colluding with the attacker, then she is uh, sort of safe here uh, in that uh, Alice cannot be linked to Bob by somebody who is uh, observing some of the nodes in the network. I should say that there are many attacks possible on Tor. One of them, for example, is called an end-to-end -end traffic correlation attack. So there are going to be timing patterns in the flow of traffic between Alice and whatever Bob is, maybe a website. And so if the attacker controls both of these links, then just by observing the correlation in those timing patterns, he might be able to determine that these two nodes are in communication with each other, even if he knows nothing about the route that the message uh, took between them. So one key point here is how do you hide routing information? What do I mean by that? When a message has gone from Alice to the first router, it has to have the IP address of Bob's computer somewhere in that message. Otherwise, there is no way that this router uh, can appropriately forward that on to reach the right destination. However, we don't want this router to actually learn that IP address because if the router does learn that IP address, then it knows both Alice's IP because the message came from her and a Bob's IP because uh, that's where the message is eventually going. And now this router uh, has the link between the two ends of the communication. And this would be a problem if this router were malicious. So as you might guess, the answer involves encryption. And as you can see in this picture, these links are in green, they're encrypted connections. And this one is an, an unencrypted connection.
Let's uh, look in more detail to see how this encryption works. It's a specific way in which encryption is used. It's called a, a layered encryption. It resembles an onion, so uh, that's why uh, onion routing is a related concept here. So what is going on here? Alice and router one share a symmetric key that's represented in purple. Alice and router two share this key that's represented in blue, and Alice and router three share the key that's represented in gold. Now these uh, symmetric keys are not stored long-term by any of these nodes. They're established as necessary uh, using key exchange. The only persistent keys are the long-term public keys of these routers. And these routers do, in fact, have long-lived identities and public keys and so on. Alice, of course, does not need to have any long-term public key. When she picks a path of these routers, she finds their public keys, executes key exchange protocols, and obtains uh, these uh, shared symmetric keys. And what she's going to do is when she sends the message to R1, it's going to be triply encrypted. The outermost layer of encryption is a symmetric encryption between Alice and R1. And so what this allows R1 to do is peel off that layer of encryption, like peeling off an onion. And when router1 peels off that layer of encryption, inside it's going to find the IP address of router2 and an encrypted message to send to router2. And it's going to forward that, router2 peels off a further layer of encryption, and then to router3, further layer of encryption. Now the message is unencrypted, consisting of the plain text message, as well as Bob's IP address. And so router3 now sends that message in plain text to Bob. Of course, uh, what you probably want to do is further layer a protocol like HTTPS or a secure web browsing on top of Tor so that even this message from router3 to, to Bob is encrypted, but the Tor protocol itself doesn't guarantee that, has no way of guaranteeing that, because uh, Bob might be a regular web server that doesn't even speak the Tor protocol, and so there's uh, no way that Tor can be responsible for the encryption between R3, which is called the exit node, and the ultimate recipient of the message. I'll leave you to think about why this wouldn't quite work if there were only one layer of encryption, for example. If Alice tried to encrypt the message all the way from her to R3, uh, it wouldn't quite work. The writing uh, would not uh, quite work out. But as it is, the very neat property that you have is that R1 only knows Alice's IP address and R2's address, does not know R3's or Bob's address. And similarly, every node knows only the addresses of the node that was one hop before it and one hop after it. And in fact, when the message gets to this point, the IP address of Alice is not even uh, present anymore, whether or not in encrypted form. So that's really how you get anonymity here. If any one of these, if R2, for example, were uh, compromised, then it would learn R1's and R3's IP addresses, but not Alice's or Bob's. So that's how Tor works. And now let's talk about uh, uh, Silk Road, and in particular, the problem that a, a site like Silk Road has to overcome is this. Silk Road is what is known as a hidden service. In other words, the Silk Road server wants to hide its address for obvious reasons. Uh, if you haven't heard about Silk Road, let me just say a sentence about it briefly. You're going to see it in more detail in the next lecture. Uh, Silk Road was a website that operated for a couple of years. It was an anonymous marketplace. It sold a variety of goods, but the thing that it was most known for is selling drugs. And because of the pervasive anonymity, or at least pseudonymity in the system, the idea was that it was very hard for law enforcement to go after. And the story of what happened next I will leave to the next lecture. But let's look, uh, look at the technology that made something like Silk Road possible and uh, the implications of that. So here is a simplified algorithm by which a server can keep its identity hidden and yet provide services through Tor. What it does is it connects through what is called a rendezvous point, which is one of the Tor routers, uh, through Tor. And then what it's going to do is it's going to publish the mapping between its name, its domain name, and the uh, address of the rendezvous point through uh, directory services that the Tor system offers. And these domain names are not your regular DNS domain names. That wouldn't work because it's this whole parallel system of routing. And so these are called onion addresses, and they're going to look like this long string dot onion. And notice that it looks a lot like uh, Bitcoin public keys and uh, it's uh, for sort of the same reasons. It's because uh, anyone can generate one of these. And now the client will have to learn the onion address of the site that it wants to visit. 
If, uh, when, this, uh, when the Silk Road existed, if you wanted to go to Silk Road, you couldn't type in silkroad.com. That wouldn't make any sense because Silk Road is not even available over the regular web. Instead, you would have to, through some manner, and this was uh, a widely known address, you would have to find, this is not Silk Road's address, by the way, this is the onion address of DuckDuckGo, a search engine that uh, offers privacy and anonymity. But uh, you would find a similar address that belonged to Silk Road and put that into your Tor-enabled browser. And that what your client would automatically do is look up the mapping for the address of the rendezvous point, connect to that rendezvous point, and through that rendezvous point, have a anonymous and encrypted connection to the ultimate server uh, without the server having to publish its actual IP address. So that covers some of the technology behind Silk Road, in particular, anonymous communication and how do you do anonymous payments, which is, of course, with Bitcoin. But still, uh, you need more technology in order to make this whole system work. You need security. In other words, how can you be sure that when you pay someone on Silk Road, they're going to actually uh, sell you the goods? Silk Road had a reputation system for that. And how do you do anonymous shipping? Uh, the site pretty much left this to the participants that advised uh, uh, buyers to provide an anonymous PO box, for example, uh, to ship goods to. So let's take a step back. We've covered a lot of technology in this lecture. Hopefully, you've understood that Bitcoin anonymity is a very powerful thing. And it gains in power when combined with other technologies, in particular, anonymous communication technologies. And also, anonymity is a deeply morally ambiguous thing. There are many moral distinctions that we would like to make that we're not able to adequately express at the technological level. And so some of this moral ambiguity uh, appears to be inherent. Hopefully, it's also been clear that anonymity is very fragile. One mistake can, uh, can create a link that uh, you're trying to hide. But also anonymity is an important thing to protect. It's worthwhile protecting. It has a lot of good uses in addition to bad uses. So most of the things that we've talked about today are either at the forefront of research technologically or they're a topic of serious ethical debates. None of this is really settled. And so this is an ongoing conversation area of ongoing research. We don't know which anonymity system for Bitcoin, if any, is going to become prominent or mainstream. And so this is a great opportunity for you, either as a developer or in thinking through the ethical implications, uh, to get involved in some of these issues. And hopefully what you've learned in this lecture has given you the right background for that. Mm -hmm.